Lucifer effect then is this transformation of good into evil. And so with that as the background, what I'm focused on is lesser transformation, not angels, but good people, and not into devils, but people who at some time do some bad things, enough so we might call them perpetrators of evil, and we'll talk about what evil is. Uh, and the key in the looser effect is the transformation, the character transformation of good people to do evil things, sometimes in some situations, as a function of powerful situational forces. So John has hinted at that, and obviously I'm going to talk about what does that mean, powerful situational forces. Let's see. So one simple definition of evil is evil is knowing better and doing worse. So you know, it's not bad, you know that, that what is right, what is moral, <coughs> what is appropriate, and you do worse. <clears throat> My psychological definition is evil is the exercise of power to intentionally harm, harm psychologically, harm, demean, degrade, dehumanize other people, or to hurt physically through torture, through rape, uh, through abuse, or ultimately to destroy, mortally, to kill people, nature, animals, or an idea, or a concept, or a religion. There's a new kind of evil in a book by Adams and Balfour recently called Administrative Evil. And I, I put it in the talk, uh, given that you're law students. And what it is, <clears throat> they say that there's an evil that we don't recognize, that in fact is a powerful, insidious evil much worse than the evil of some drug deal and beating up some old, some, somebody to get some money. It says, public and private organizations operate in legal frameworks, not in ethical frameworks. And, and so they can inflict suffering, personal losses, even death to people by following cold-hearted rationality. It's a rationality for achieving what? The goals of their ideology, a market plan, cost-benefit, bottom line, efficiency, and profit, as long as they're not prohibited by law. Furthermore, he says, as long as the ends justify all means necessary. Okay? Uh, and it's the means necessary where the evil behavior comes in. But they always do it in disguised fashion. It's always a veil of secrecy. So you never quite know until the Enron blows up, or to Worldcom blows up, or to, uh, to uh, Abu Ghraib blows up, or Attica blows up. So you know about this, so in every case, these are going on for weeks, for months, for years, uh, in, under this cover of administrative evil. So we just want to put that in the background, it's a different kind of evil. And as I start talking about this, my students will say, why are we so fascinated with evil? Nobody cares about goodness, nobody cares about Lucifer, we care about the devil. I mean, why are all those images, you know, put Google good, or Google angels, you know, they flap away. And I think it has only to do with that good, evil, is the exercise of power, control, and domination. And that's the fascination. We don't like to admit it, but I think that's what we're fascinated with. And we're more fascinated, and it's over people, it's over nature, it's over animals, and it's especially when it's creative, unique, raw, extreme. We don't really care about the consequences. It's not that we're fascinated because 3,000, whatever, 127 people died at 9-11. It's the idea that somebody had to weaponize a commercial airliner and fly it into the World Trade Towers, and the thing dissolved before our eyes. That's, all, that's in one sense, ultimate evil, but it's also ultimate power. So it's not that we as the viewing public, we as general good people, enjoy seeing animals killed or nature destroyed or people hurt. It's that anybody could do that. What it means is when something becomes thinkable, it becomes possible for us. So there's always a sense, could I do that? So I think what I try to do in the looser effect is really to say, it tells us we really don't understand very deeply about who we are as individuals. And in fact, it says, we really don't know anybody, except in very limited situations. You think you know your parents. Think about how little time you actually have spent with them. You think your parents know you. When the, after you got out of high school, how much time do they spend with you? And do they ever see you in the 50 situations that you're in? They see you in the slice of life. And everybody we know we see in that slice of life. And we assume that they are the, that person you see is the same across all situations. And what psychologists clearly show is that behavior changes across situations. Personality predicts 
only when people are in the same situation. It doesn't predict, the best personality tests don't predict across time and across very different situations. I got out of the army I got in the Korean War, imagine that, uh, by working at the West Haven VA. I, I delayed turning in my dissertation for a year, and uh, if I, when you got to be 26, then you were no longer eligible for the draft. Uh, so I didn't have to say I'm a coward or a draft dodger, I just worked with crazy people for a year. Uh, and I learned a lot about psychology, and one of the things you learn is that in order to understand a patient, you always have a case conference that everybody who studied this patient comes and describes the patient, you show all of the, the data, and that's the case example on which you build actually abnormal psychology. So I want to start with the case example of evil. These are the actual images from the cameras of, of the soldiers who were in the basement of Abu Ghraib in a special place called Tier 1A, and that's a critical thing. Nobody's told you about what Tier 1A means. Uh, and what I've done is arranged them in a dramatic scenario. So these are the static pictures. What I've done is I've added sound, I've added movement, in order to get a feeling of what it must have been like, first to be one of these prisoners, and then what it must have been like to be one of these guards. So let's descend into that dungeon. Let's open the dungeon door and go down. And these are not the worst of the pictures. There are more than a thousand pictures because everybody had digital cameras, digital, digital uh, um, uh, cell phones. And they took pictures and they weren't censored because you didn't have to send them to a, to a Photoshop. Uh, this is uh, Brigadier General Janice Karpinski, who was supposed to be in charge of that prison, never once visited Tier 1A uh, uh, during the, the three months this was going on. These abuses went on for a period of three months, September, October, November, into December 2003. Uh, this is uh, former uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. <coughs> uh, we're going to say, <coughs> and so the question is, who is responsible for, who is responsible for these abuses? Um, which is one way to ask the question. Of course, the answer was the bad apples. 